Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the greatest podcast on planet Earth. We did another voting and we won again. Again. We are still the greatest podcast on planet Earth. Voted by Sarah Riley this time. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it was a tough choice, but we had a clear winner. Yeah. <laughs> so, Nick, how are you, my man? What's going hey, on? you know, I'm doing really well. You know, it's great to be here. I'm just happy that I'm so close to you in this podcast. Like, we've been so distant before. And I'm like, now we're finally back like the old times. Yeah, look, we're upset that we're not in the studio where there's a little bit of space <laughs> between us, but, you know, it's, right. it's always good, it's to, be, it's, it's always good to be next to my, my good mate. <laughs> but look, today we have a special guest. We do indeed. As, as per usual on a beautiful Thursday morning or whenever you guys are listening to this. Thursday morning, hopefully. Um, yeah, so we got someone that's actually really, really, really talented. Someone that's doing a lot of cool stuff, uh, a lot of interesting stuff that is needed in the space. 100%. Specifically in the entrepreneurial space, executive space, um, the space that is oftentimes a bit neglected because people have this perception of people at that level that they're superhuman. Mm. They've achieved a lot, so they, you know, they don't need any work. Yeah, I think that she's breaking down those barriers and doing really, really cool shit, really, really cool stuff. Mm. You know, the one and only Miss Sarah Riley. What's going on? It's all going on, man. Thanks for having me. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. What's happening? How's your day been? Talk to me. We talk back. It's a talk show. You know? <laughs> That's how this works. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Oh, well, you caught me at a good moment, actually. It's been a huge couple of weeks for yep. me personally. I mean, as I was saying before, I usually help everybody else through their catharsis and reprogramming, but you can only stay ahead in that space if you're prepared to keep doing your own work. And this past couple of weeks has been pretty huge for my own breakthroughs. So yeah. feeling feeling calm, feeling philosophical. Yes. Yeah, feeling like I've been confronted with a lot new truths in the last couple of weeks yeah, so yeah. yeah i'm pleased to be sitting down for this conversation awesome oh. are you always learning any type of person that's always learning like is yeah 100 percent. That... um with the nature of the work that i do you have to be staying ahead because the people that i work with are phenomenal you know right. I, I tend not to work with beginners in this space so the yeah. people that i'm working with have done a lot of personal development they want to take it deeper they want to mm. go further and you know the way that i work is you can't you can't just tell someone there's a light at the end of the tunnel if you're not prepared to go in it yourself, right? Exactly. You've got to do your own navigation first so that when they're in catharsis, when they're navigating the hard stuff, when they're facing the truths, you know what they're going through and you can be there for them in the full spectrum of yeah, ways. Yeah, I love that. Exactly. I think that's so important. And for the guys that are listening, like, what's the space that you work in? And even just as another add to that question, like, what made you want to go into that space in the first place? Mm, it's funny you should ask me that right now. I had my strategist say to me last week that who I am right now is a very fluid concept. But yeah. uh, if we give it the biggest summary possible, it's um, I work with execs, entrepreneurs and creatives. And the work that I do with them is around recoding and reprogramming who their nervous system and their subconscious mind thinks they are. Mm -hmm. Because we can only manifest, we can only bring in, we can only f find uh, success in the area that our system is happy to receive, that it thinks yeah. is safe, that it thinks is safe for us. Yeah. Um, so you can't really create a new external world unless you map it on the inside first, right? Yes. Everything in your world is just a reflection of who you think you are on the inside. Yeah. So if you're not going to elevate that, you're not going to expand the parameters of your identity, you can't expect to see any expansion in your yeah. uh, reflected reality in the, in the 3D space. Awesome. So you're basically breaking down, re you're breaking people's reality mm. by breaking people's internal work, right? Yeah, so. I call it the decode and recode because, yeah. um, you know, whoever you are now is essentially just the, the product of how you came into the world and what we, or what went in during your formative years, right? Yeah. Um, but for most of us, we're breaking a lot of rules as adults, you know? We grew up learning that you can't have everything and money doesn't grow on trees mm. and, you know, wishing won't make it so and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Whereas, you know, we come into our adult lives and we're like, well, actually, I want to change the world. I want to make a million dollars. I want to help a thousand people. I want to do all this amazing stuff. Yeah. And that's not typically who we grew up knowing that we were. And so yeah. if we want to break those rules, if we want to change the programming, you've got to go deep and find, find the old rules so that you can break them. Yeah. And what do you think is the number one thing that when you start working with a client is something that you need to address? What's the one thing that you find that's like, okay, there's always this that is re re required to address? Is it mm. childhood trauma? Is it... I mean, what childhood trauma is a given just mm. because it's not about how nice your parents were because, yeah. the, you know, the, the trauma comes down to how your nervous system perceived things. Yeah. And when we, were, when we were three, like, we know we didn't perceive things clearly, mm. right? Mm. We were missing context and empathy and intellectual reasoning and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Um, but the number one and most important thing we need to get straight on right off the bat is that you 
I don't know how this is going to come across, but you can't right. you can't limit yourself to just what your eyes can see and your ears can hear, right? Mm -hmm. These are globes, these are tubes, they're just methods of getting electrical data into the brain. Right. Once that data is in the brain, uh, it's filtering, deleting, distorting, generalizing to fit your old story. So yeah. whatever you think is possible, if you're basing that on what you've seen and heard and what you can imagine personally, that's probably 1% of what's actually possible for you. And mm. we have to get very clear right off the bat that reality is subjective, changeable, malleable, and pretty much everything you're dreaming of is 100% possible. Yeah. Mm. And how do you get someone to actually deep that because like you said because <laughs> yeah. yeah. pretend i'm a 40 year old exec let's not even say let's pretend we're our age right mm -hmm. we've we've lived a entrepreneurial lifestyle we've done a lot of cool shit we've been xyz our perception is that like the world is the world you know mm -hmm. what i mean yeah. like the world is the world the reality is reality so how do i how do you make me how do you make it make sense to me that i can actually come everything that i know is in fact maybe not 100% true or mm -hmm. it's not the one it's not the full truth maybe it's 1% 2% 5% mm -hmm. how do I how do you get me to realize that you mean short of actually just giving the acid <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> need for speed <laughs> Yeah, if you live in a country where you're not legally allowed to give them acid, yeah. uh, I mean, that's a shortcut. But if you want to do it legally and verbally, um, there's lots of different ways. I mean, when I'm working with someone, every single situation is completely different, right? So I would relate it back to everything they've been through and it would be relevant to where their psyche is at the moment. Because the first thing I would do is map their model of the world. Yeah. So I would want to know what they think is possible. And a lot of the time, by the time people come to me, they've reached a stage where they... Even if it's painful, they're prepared to admit that more is possible. And maybe it might only be because of the people they follow on Instagram, right? Like yeah. we have this old model from childhood that the more you work, the more money you get and you have to work really hard to be successful. Yeah. Mm. Quick scroll of Instagram will tell you that's bullshit. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right? How many how many 21-year-olds you see traveling the world doing fuck all for, you know, millions of dollars <laughs> yeah. a year, right? If how hard you work directly correlates to how much money you make, how come the janitor doesn't make more than the CEO? Exactly. Yeah. Right? Like if you look at this objectively, none of the rules we really got taught growing up uh, hold water. Mm. right so if i'm working with a client i would look at their individual mapping first because some of these examples might not be relevant but i think thanks to the beauty of the internet we can see now all over the world what everyone's doing and what what is possible mm. so it's almost it's getting harder and harder to deny the idea mm. that anything's possible right because everything we think wasn't possible someone's already it's doing it and we can done. see it yeah yeah I think that's such a good point as well because especially like especially in our day and age like social mm. media and like us scrolling through and seeing how other mm. people live life is like a massive part of like who we are yeah. we, we tend to get to a trap that i find sometimes is that we compare ourselves too much on social media to a fact that's like well if that's their reality and that's how they're living like we understand that of course people can do fuck all and still make a living but mm -hmm. it's like here i am doing fuck all and still not making any money yeah. or i don't want to live that kind of lifestyle how do you think people kind of like can understand that but also understand from their point of view and where mm -hmm. they're at in terms of alignment to still push out what their one percent more is or what their two percent more is mm -hmm. i think um i think an important part of that is learning to understand and manage triggers because yes. if you see someone doing something online and you feel um anything in the category of upset, right? Yeah, Basically yeah. you're thinking, oh, well, they're lucky or their parents must be this or they were born with a silver spoon up their ass yeah. or something, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. right? Like there's, there's two ways to deal with a trigger. You can recognize that the fact that you're feeling pain means you have a wound and yeah. this person has trod on your wound. Mm. But if there's a wound there, then that tells you that your ego has a rule about something and you could get excited and be like, oh shit, I just found a piece of programming. Mm. If I dig this out, then my current reality can change. Mm. Or you can go the quick and dirty route and just project your shit onto someone else. Yeah, That is a short term way of relieving the pain and unfortunately, most people don't understand triggers. They don't understand that the voice in their head is not them. Yeah. yeah. They don't understand, you know, what their the reaction in their head and in their nervous system means. If you could teach them to understand and how to manage a trigger, you can teach them that things like jealousy and envy are they're not a problem, they're just really good data. Mm. Right? If you're feeling jealousy, all that means is that you have a desire for what you're seeing, but you have a piece of coding that says you don't get it. Yeah, I love right? that. And when you can teach people yeah, to understand sure. and, you know, break apart all of that programming a bit more, now you can look at people like um, 
I don't know who's a good example, Amanda, Amanda Francis, mm. right? She has an amazing um, Instagram account. She's known as the money queen, right? And mm. she's very triggering to a lot of people who are still <laughs> yeah. holding onto the coding that you have to work really hard to earn every dollar Yeah. because, you know, she obviously disproves that every day. <laughs> but once you can teach people how to understand, break it, map it, then they look at people like Amanda and instead of seeing something that pains them, they see what's possible for them too. Yes. And once they can understand the idea that it's possible for them, that's a chink in the armor. Yeah. Once you can get a foothold on that, you can get the subconscious to take on anything. Yeah, I love that. And I think that even like how you say this, like I get excited by thinking like there's so much untapped potential that we mm. have that we need to dig deep into, yeah. figure out. And once we dig deep and we understand that, whether that's you know through our triggers and stuff, mm. then there's so much more that we're capable of. And for me, I'm excited, but that's because of course, as our background, we're yeah. psychiatric nurses. We do a lot yeah. of work mentally. We, of we, we value the intangibles where a lot of people value the tangibility of things. Mm. Yeah. How do you think people can get excited about the fact that what how they're living and how they're playing right now isn't at their 100%? And that, you know, mm. when things like jealousy, envy and stuff pop up, it's actually an opportunity for them to dig deeper and actually dig deep into whatever that trauma is or whatever it is that's bothering them mm. to take them and elevate them to that next level. How do people get excited about that? Yeah, that's a good question because, I mean, all human emotion is controlled by the narrative, right? A lot of mm. people would think that how they feel is dependent on what's going on in their outer world, mm. but that's not how emotions work biologically. That's not how they work, right? I mean, we are exposed to environmental stimulus, sure, but it's our interpretation of the stimulus that determines the emotion that we feel, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that because you put, have you guys ever been to a horror movie in a cinema? Yeah. Of course, yeah. Right? Like, so some people are freaking out. Some people are so scared they leave or they bury themselves under their partner's sweater. Some people are asleep. Some mm. people are laughing hysterically, right? Mm. So we know that, you know, just because a certain stimulus is happening doesn't mean that's controlling how mm. you feel. Yeah. So when it comes to getting people excited, it comes down to the story they're telling about it and about what's yes. possible, right? Mm. So there's a certain extent there's a certain, like some people, they have to get to a certain level of rock bottom before mm. they can consider there must be more than this. Some yeah. people don't have to get to that. They can just decide that there must be more of this and they're willing to, you know, go through the pain before they've been pushed. Yeah. But I think there's so much bio-individuality here, mm. right? I think people will get there when they're ready. And I also think that it's really important for coaches and people who want to help to not try to overstep when that person is ready for that yeah. you know like i don't try to create excitement or motivation in someone who hasn't got to a personal place where they want to see what's possible yeah do you feel like well if people come to you it, to some degree do they not want to see what's possible people oh. come to me when they want real change okay they come to me when they want a full transformation they don't come to me when they just want someone to hear them vent yeah that's yeah. not where i play and it goes pretty badly in the discovery call as you can imagine <laughs> yeah. it's like i'm not going to pander to or support your limitations mm. i'm going to show you what's possible it will be uncomfortable for your nervous system because anytime you introduce massive change to the nervous system, you're gonna feel it. But if the person wants change more than they wanna stay the same, they will sit through the discomfort and they get the rewards that's on the other side. Yeah, mm. yeah. So <clears throat> how do you actually do this, right? Because no, you don't have to go through your whole- Yeah, that's <laughs> such yeah. a broad question. Like we don't have enough time. <laughs> but like, what's like something that you just, when you think about it, it's like, okay, what's the key strategy that you use? Like, let's say for example, if we're doing, if we're doing a counseling session or whatever, we would use typically CBT, you uh -huh. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, sure. So like, what's something that you use? Is it NLP? Is it something that's completely different? Uh, yeah. What do you use? Coaching is a blend of all of that great mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, strategic intervention is the model that Tony Robbins teaches, and that's a blend of human needs, psychology, and NLP. Absolutely, we use NLP because it's the language of the subconscious, and you're obviously going to talk to people's subconscious in a coaching session to get them to take on a different idea. Um, how it happens varies greatly. I don't often do trance work um, over Skype or Zoom because obviously if the if the connection drops out, you're like, oops. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> I, uh, I haven't done it um, very often because of that, but there was one time where I could clearly see the woman's, um, the, the relevant destructive neural connection. Mm -hmm. And I knew we were gonna be able to get through it in about 15 minutes and the connection was really stable. So trance work is an option. Mm -hmm. um, trauma work is super important and by trauma work it's this is the kind of topic mm. where if we don't have the background then it's going to get real esoteric and a little bit boring for people who yeah. don't have the context so yeah. i'll just sort of skim over it basically we're looking for the programming in the system and looking for where it's stored in the body and helping the person to catharsis to release it yeah. once they can see the programming once we drag that out into the sunlight it's not in the driver's seat anymore mm. the thing is 95 percent of our day is controlled by the subconscious mind and if you don't know what rules it's calibrating to you don't know why or how or where it's steering you 
Mm. Most people will think that they're making all of their own choices during the day, like what to eat, where to mm. shop, how to, you know, what they feel like eating, drinking, when they feel like it, how they cope with their varying emotions. But it'll just be a whole lot of set of rules that govern how you get through the day. Yeah. So until you see that programming, there isn't, you know, you can't change it. So it's around finding the specific wording, the specific coding that was inputted at various points of your childhood, bringing it out so that we can examine it. If you want to keep it, keep it. If it's not helping you anymore, if it's not producing the results in your life, then maybe we change it up. Mm. And then the coach's job is to provide support, accountability, consistency, while we integrate the new neural connection. Because a neural connection, like anything, takes time to cement, takes time to get solid, takes time to become the subconscious mind's default setting. Mm. Mm. I that's, love that. That's awesome. Like mm. so much wisdom and stuff that you're sharing here that I think that a lot of our listeners are going to get so much value from, which is like yeah. the most important thing at the end of the day. So. Really I'm want- geeking out myself. I'm like, oh, I want to know more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> oh, it's the funnest topic. I always say <laughs> yeah, I have yeah. like the best job in the world is just, you know, messing with people's subconscious minds. It's like yeah, the most sure. fun ever because I'm so interested in people and what they've been through. Like for years before, I thought it was even possible to be a coach. Mm. Anytime I was out to dinner, out for drinks or just socializing with people, I was mm. always... You know, I'm not a I'm not a talk about the weather kind of person. I'm very yeah. much like, what are you working on at the moment? What are you saving for? Yeah. What's the plan? What are you hoping you'll have by the end of the year? And yeah. I look back on that and I think, wow, those questions were really out of line. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I might not even know the person. I'm like, what are you working on this year? And yeah, they're like, yeah. what? They're like, <laughs> they're onto their sixth beer, and they and we don't even know each other. And, and I'm and I'm asking them what they're saving for, and you know what they're how they're stepping through, and it's just that's just always been what I'm interested yeah. in people is getting them to where they want to go quicker than they think is possible. Exactly. And, and that's what we want to do as well. Like we, our big thing is that we think that too many people have so many superficial conversations and mm-hmm. they don't get down to the roots of what's actually going on. And we actually did a podcast the other day. Funny you talk about what are you saving for? What are you spending? What are you doing? Because we did a podcast with this guy called Jins, which is the CEO of like Incent. And he was talking a lot about financial management and the stigma around finances that yeah. people aren't too comfortable having these uncomfortable conversations about finances money it's like we all know that everyone can relate to this everybody goes through it but for some reason we don't want to have that conversation for whatever reason in your experience how do you think people can actually break through of like that you know feeling uncomfortable stuck in the closet and like to be a bit more open to like have a bit more conversations or whatever it is that's holding them back Mm. conversations was just an example where we can even talk about like people that want to get to the next level in terms of their jobs but they're fearful about maybe rejection or maybe i'm not worthy of us actually taking in that level like what's Mm. your thoughts on breaking people through that well i want to say something that's you know sort of an overview enough that's going to be valuable to everybody listening so Mm. i guess the point i would want to make is humans only move in two directions we move towards pleasure and away from pain but because we're programmed for survival, we're always going to do more to move away from pain than we are to get to pleasure, mm. right? So if you are like, if you're still at a place where uh, we call it limbo in the life coaching world, which is where you know your life's not perfect. If you had a magic wand, you'd definitely change some stuff. But it's not so bad that you have to move, yes. right? Like your jobs paying all your bills and everything yeah. is very comfortable, even if you don't like it, yeah. right? until you get to a point where the pain of staying the same is finally more than the pain of moving, you'll probably find that you keep choosing the comfortable option. So you can either jump because you know that the push is coming Mm. or you can wait until you get pushed. But either way, it's it's coming. Yeah. And did you ever have a moment where you decided that you needed to move towards pleasure? Um, I, unfortunately, the first big one was very much getting pushed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm mm. sorry to say that I uh, I knew I should have jumped years before I did. And when I got pushed, it was spectacular. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I was in my previous career. I was in risk management um, for 10 years. I started out in frontline occupational safety and I just sort of fell ass backwards into the job. Basically, I was already working at the company. They needed someone to take over another department. They offered me a pay rise when I particularly needed one. Mm. So I was like, fuck it, I can learn any job for a pay rise. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I took it on and, you know, it was it was great it was a good opportunity I don't want to talk it down because it got me you know it was one of the components that got me where I am today so I'm not super nag on it but it also wasn't my dream right and that's where I think many people in a nine-to-five are and most people like oh no I don't mind it and my question is always would you go if they stop paying you Hmm. if you wouldn't keep doing it when they stop paying you it's not your purpose it's not your you know this might be a flaw of excellence for you you might be great at it but it's Hmm. not your flaw of genius 
Uh, right. Um, and so I was in that working my way up the ranks. Um, I went from manager to senior manager, area manager, regional manager across, you know, from one branch to, you know, seven, five, six, seven branches, I think, across two countries. And then I ended up in um, a corporate position. I was one of eight people running a $400 million business. And wow. it was my executive role, reporting direct to CEO and the board. And, you know, I'd sort of made it. You know, mm, in inverted yeah. commas to anyone who's not watching the video, like made in it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like uh, I had um, two rental properties and a six figure salary and a corner mm. office and, you know, and I was and a seat at the table, mm. you know, and it was on paper. It looked great. But in reality, I was crying in the shower every morning before wow. going to work. The stress, um, the, the amount of cortisol in my system, I was so inflamed that, you know, you, when you're super stressed and you get stress acne, well, mm. it wasn't healing. So there were mm. holes in my face. Yeah. And like, I don't mean to get super disgusting in case anyone's eating while we're talking about this, but like <laughs> literal holes in my face. Yeah. And it's like, you can't put makeup when there's blood running down your face wow. right from the stress, you know? And I mean, I'm not a big drinker, but I was having red wine after work to wind down like on weeknights. Mm. And that's kind of an indicator for me. Um, yeah. So it looked great on paper, but it was super terrible. And I remember back then I was still living in a very sort of nervous, anxious state, and I still had a lot of people pleaser tendencies. Yeah. And so you know, we had we had someone at work uh, snap and just lose their shit at me, just yeah. absolutely unload. It was it was not warranted. I was not the person who was in control of all the shit that wasn't happening, but. Yeah you know, people unload on where they feel safe to unload on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that happened. And I remember driving home thinking, well, fuck, that's my weekend ruined, right? Because I'm going to be feeling bad about that the whole weekend. Mm -hmm. And then on the drive home, I realized I couldn't feel anything. Mm -hmm. And I was like, when you push yourself past the current confines of your own nervous system, that's a real wake up call, right? Yeah. Because that that's the sort of thing that would normally scare the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't feel anything and so i got to the point where even a an executive salary and all of the safety that that came with was not enough to make me keep it and considering mm. like mm. i grew up real poor we were welfare kids and um you know i <laughs> like it's funny when you look back on it because at the time you know if you grew up poor you don't as long as you're eating you yeah, don't know you you're don't that poor. you know I you know that you don't get to go on any holidays you know you're the one family without a car you know that you know you <laughs> can't play any sports at school, school. Yeah, 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 yeah no excursions yeah. you're not allowed to play sports at school <laughs> yeah. because you know soccer requires shoes Fight, and yeah. you can't get them and it's you have to so, pay five dollars for sport yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> you know you start work when you're 13 and stuff but yeah. it's just you know so you know but i look back on it and i'm like Oh, I remember one winter where we burnt a wall for firewood and yeah. it's like, <laughs> and so you work your way up to a six figure salary and you know what effect that has on the nervous system of someone with an impoverished identity. Yeah. And I still let it get to the point where I was prepared to lose absolutely everything. And I was sure I was going to lose everything. I mm. was my, like my programming was you have to go to work to get money and you have to get money to survive. Mm. And that's the limits of the coding. Mm. And so I really thought I was going to lose everything I'd worked from my whole life and end up under a bridge. And it was still a better option than going to one more fucking meeting. Yeah, wow. And so I, you know, I'm not proud to tell you I let it get right to the point where I was so debilitated that I would literally have traded my life for a cardboard box, but I did. Yeah. And, you know, obviously we know how the story ends. It doesn't happen like that at all when you when you take a big faith-based jump from something you hate and go in the direction of your dreams. Because I didn't know, I still thought being a coach was impossible. Um, because it is a hell of a lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it was still a big stretch from what I thought was possible. Mm. But um, at that time, I thought, you're already in your 30s. You haven't crossed off any of the big items on your bucket list. You should do it now because we're not guaranteed a long life, right? Yeah. You get wiped out all the time. I don't mean to say that flippantly, but the bottom line is you're not guaranteed the 80 years on yeah, your life exactly. expectancy, right? It could yeah. be your time any day. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And yeah. I, don't, I didn't want to die without doing any of the things that were on my list. So I thought I sold everything I owned and I wow. mean everything right down to my clothing. Wow. I packed a backpack and I went to Bali for a month, did a bunch of trauma work with Mastin Kip. And that's where I found the first the really hugest piece of coding that had stopped me launching my own business. And I remember sitting up from this like meditative exercise mm -hmm. and going, oh, and suddenly seeing how all the pieces of my life fit together, understanding why I did everything I did, understanding why I was scared to do everything, understanding why I was, why certain things seemed impossible to me. And I got up and I walked back to my hotel room and I signed up for my coaching certification, my North American coaching certification, launched my business a little while later and we made money right from the start and it's been pretty much sold out ever since. Wow. And this is exactly why I'm so passionate about the idea of getting into your coding because 
every time I find another piece of programming and I get it out of my nervous system, a whole new part of the world opens up to yeah. me. Oh. I only have a business because of that one specific sentence that we found. Mm. Like, awesome. oh, you want to know it? Yeah. 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 So like, you know how everyone says, oh, it's really hard to be self-employed and where would you even find clients? Yeah. And you, you know, the money's really unstable and all of that crap. Yeah. Beliefs are strategic, right? Everyone thinks that humans' beliefs are based on evidence. They're not. They're yeah. strategic. They exist to protect pieces of survival coding, mm -hmm. which is why when you, um, you know, people often, spend, I say that, this is my analogy. I say, you know, you can sit with a counselor and you can spend a lot of time, and this is not at all um, dragging counselors. They mm -hmm. fulfill an amazing job. But if you try to use them for coaching, you're going to be doing a lot of work on the beliefs, but the, but the beliefs are just branches off the tree and if you mm. don't firebomb the tree trunk they've still got a fuel source right yeah. so for me all of those stories about i can't be a coach you know who would even hire me and i you know i don't know all the answers and i'm not perfect and i'm not nice enough and i'm not you know like all <laughs> these stories mm. i in this meditative um exercise i went back to a time in my childhood where i was sitting with an adult who was um drunk suicidal you know the whole shebang mm. and i was coaching them because that was my job as the kid is, you know, doing that work. And I wrote, I realized like my subconscious said it loud and clear. When you help people, when you try to help people, they don't get better. They harm themselves and then they blame you. Hmm. Cause that's what was going on all through my childhood. And hmm. I suddenly had this like epiphany and I was like, Oh my God, all of these beliefs about how, Oh, where would you even find clients? And it's so hard to run your own business and you don't know how tech works and you've never run an online company mm. before. And all of that shit was all strategically placed beliefs because my system knew that helping people was the most painful thing you could ever do in the world. Mm. Mm. Once that, once we'd firebombed that tree trunk, once that was no more, once my system didn't know that anymore, all of those branches do exactly what you'd expect they'd do if you firebomb the tree trunk. Yeah. The nutrient source is gone, they wither and die. Wow. So now there's no part of me that believes it's hard to get clients. There's no part of me that thinks mm. that any of that crap was relevant anymore. And because it was all gone, I launched a coaching business. We sold packages. I say we, I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I sold packages right from the get-go and I didn't start on any of the baby rates. I wasn't doing, you know, most people start with individual sessions, 100 bucks an hour. Nope, I was selling three. And the, the first package I ever sold was six months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, because once your nervous system doesn't know that everything's hard and impossible anymore, it's not. Yeah. Your world is limited by what your coding tells you. If you take the coding out, you're not limited anymore. You can do anything. Mm. And was it like a, was this like a light bulb moment that you just, everything snapped or was it you had to do heaps of work based off that sentence? It depends. I like to say some pieces of coding slide off like a snake skin you're ready to let them go. They're not you anymore. And you know, it's, it's their time. Others pass like a kidney stone. Mm -hmm. You are not ready to let them go. And you think that they relate directly to who you think you are and you think they keep you safe. And you know, you think mm -hmm. that like, for example, um, fabricating victimization, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people are only used to getting their love and connection through sympathy. Mm -hmm. You can't get sympathy if you don't have problems right yeah. and so their nervous system will keep generating problems and you start talking to them about finding that connection around love and sympathy yeah. and that one that one very rarely slides off like a snake skin that one passes like a kidney stone in a huge way like recognizing mm. your own victimization like personal mm. victimization yeah. is that's rough that's rough yeah. and that's hard you know and so in many cases there might be a moment of catharsis that one there's usually a bit of crying very rarely do people actually vomit but it happens <laughs> right depends how ready you are to let go of it and how how motivated you are to let yeah. go of it mm. how like because i remember when i started working on my own victimization um my nervous system was scared as all hell that if i if every time someone asked me how i was i said great people would stop asking and the mental picture was that they would all just fade away into the background and then no one would care and then i would die alone oh yeah right so when you first decide that you know you're going to let go of that one you've got to have a pretty big motivation and, and my motivation was i was sick of being I just felt like in every social circle that I was in, I felt like I was always the victim. I was always the one who had problems. I was always the one complaining about something. I was always the one whose health was in the toilet. I was always the one who was just struggling to get through all the time. And I was like, mm. I know that I can choose and program any identity I want. And that's not a character I want to play anymore. Mm. Wow. That's mm. awesome. How long has that been? How long, how long ago did this all happen? Um, 
three and a bit years, I think. Wow. Uh, I first met Maston Kip in person in, I think it was October of 2016. Yeah. And we hung out for a month and then I went and hung out with him in Hawaii again for a week. So that, you know, the work he does is really intensive. Yeah. So those were both huge. Um, I did some Tony Robbins seminars. I did my, um, I'm almost finished my mastery coaching certificate through him too. That's the next level up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's basically been going hard on the deprogramming <laughs> for like coming up four years. Mm. And it's, yeah, it's huge. Like pot roast, right? Because I think that oh, right, people yeah. can understand the whole concept of like, okay, if I'm sad all the time, yeah then I'm a victim, well, but it's, what's the- It's just yeah. that if you have started to interpret certain acts as a way to feel cared about, right? Like when people listen to you and focus on you and hear you cry, or if they come around when you're feeling sad and share a drink with you, or if when it's time to commiserate about something terrible that happened to work, people meet you for drinks, your nervous system starts to associate that with mm. a way to get connection. Once it learns that that's how you get connection, which is the primary need of a herd species like us, mm. um, then it will keep recreating the circumstances that led to getting the need met. Mm. So if you get your love and connection through alcohol, if you get it through sympathy, if you get it through anything else that is you know, ultimately insufficient, unsustainable, and kind of a, a cheap alternative mm. to real love, then your system is just gonna keep crea creating the circumstances. And you're like, why does this always happen to me? And it's like, well, you haven't found a better way to meet that need. Mm. Survival needs are no joke, right? The six mm. human survival needs, these are not nice to have. Your nervous mm. system will meet them come hell or high water. Yeah. So if you don't learn what they are and go after them in a healthy way, like you can get certainty and safety through a drug habit. Mm. It's consistent, it's predictable, you know it's gonna make you feel better. Or you can get consistency and safety through a gym routine. Right, yep. you go every day, you meet the same friends there, you see them, you work out together, you make progress, you make gains, you know that if you go, you'll get endorphins, yeah. right? Like you can create consistency, certainty, and safety through in many different habits. It's just that people don't realize if you don't go out of your way to get those needs met in a healthy, sustainable fashion, the needs will still get met. Yeah. yeah. But it'll just be done outside of you and in a way that you probably don't like. Exactly. Yeah. But I think that's very relevant because even like as you were sharing your story, like I just reflect back because I used to work in a bank in very like corporate environment. A lot of people were right. stressing, but they all wanted to get to the next level. Yeah. And when you ask that question about like, well, if they weren't paying you to do this, would you still go? Mm. Everyone's like, no, I wouldn't. Because there's obviously like a level of satisfaction that's yeah. not there, but they just feel like because of my ego or whatever, I'm a people pleaser or whatever pressures are out there externally that I have to keep doing it. And a lot of the colleagues that I spoke to would be like, you know, after a stressful day of work, I'm going to like jug a whole like a bottle of wine. Like that's just kind of like my habit now. That's what I do. Yeah. And a lot of people standard. get stuck in. Huh? I was just saying that's the standard corporate. Yeah, like that's, that's the, the standard, standard corporate, corporate life. life. And I feel like a lot of people kind of um, have those bad habits that they don't, they know are bad habits, but they just feel like there's nothing else that I can do to really get by. Like this is the early short-term gratification mm -hmm. that I can be doing on a daily basis to get by work. For people that are out there, what are some practical things that you think that they can be doing? Like they feel stuck. They feel, you know, I know this is a bad habit, but I just can't break out of it. Like what are some things that people can do to be aware of the healthy habits or other alternatives that they can be doing um, to help facilitate whatever it is that they're going through. Mm. Okay, so you probably want to start by learning about human survival needs so that you know what's driving your nervous system's behavior. Mm -hmm. So there's certainty, it's another word for safety. Uh, yeah. Uncertainty, another word for variety, adventure, spice, dare I say it, drama. <laughs> right, you can always tell who's not getting enough uncertainty and variety and adventure in their life because they're the ones starting shit at family get-togethers, <laughs> right? Yeah. The one that always kicks yeah. off. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's because nothing else kicking off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we have significance, which is a feeling of importance, uniqueness, right? That's really critical because we came from, like if you go back to caveman times, you had to have a certain level of significance. People had to know you existed. Otherwise, when the tribe moved on, they might leave you behind. They might not notice if you didn't come back from a hunting expedition, mm. come find you. Mm. You know, you had to have a certain level of significance that's important um, and then love and connection and love slash connection is one survival need because love ultimately is, is the truest need of, mm -hmm. of the human system but if we learned in childhood that love comes with pain because our parental relationship was unstable or you know one minute they loved us the next they're smacking us down the hallway right we learn that love equals pain and we're too mm. scared to go for it so we settle for connection mm. and this is where you see people chasing you know red flags and stuff yeah. like that because they have to have the connection 
And it, the saddest thing is people really beat themselves up for going after connection. You know, there's yeah. this misunderstanding that it's some kind of weakness to be, you know, seeing people in different capacities and in different lengths of time. But the bottom line is you have to have human connection. And if your mm -hmm. system is too terrified of real, intimate, vulnerable love, it'll settle for literal, physical human connection. And it's nothing mm -hmm. to be ashamed of. It just means that you probably want to look at why your connection cup is so empty mm -hmm. that you would be pushed mm -hmm. to to be settling for what you're settling for. Mm. And then the last two are contribution and growth. And those two are the two things that are needed for the um, sensation of fulfillment. So if you're feeling like you're doing a lot, but you're not fulfilled, you wanna look at contribution and growth specifically, the way you contribute to your community and your social setting and the way that you're growing and improving and making progress as a person. So if you wanna work through those and the way that you currently meet those needs with a coach, you can look at, because any behavior that is becoming a bit of an addiction it means that it's meeting more than three out of six of the needs. Mm -hmm. Three out of six is the threshold for addiction. Once it meets more than three out of six, you are looking at seeing some compulsive behavior that starts to get a bit out of your control. Mm. So what I'm saying about what people can do to help themselves is learn to understand this for mm. two reasons. One, because once you understand what your nervous system's doing, it makes everything a lot easier to work with. Mm. But two, so that you take the guilt and shame out of it, mm. right? You're yeah. human everyone's nervous system is fighting to meet those needs. You're not special, you're not worse, you're not better. You're just a person, Yeah. Mm. right? And also I think it gives people a sense of, um, I always found the extra knowledge and perspective uh, was very calming. You know, once you realize that you're not broken, you're not damaged, you're not confusing, you're not quote unquote too fucked up, <laughs> yeah. right? As people often say when they first come to a coach, you're actually, a lot of what your nervous system is doing is it's firing on all cylinders. It's working pretty textbook. It's just, you know, the coding is out of date. And so it's recreating a situation you don't want. So mm. we'll change the calibration. So find out about those six human needs. Look at the habits that you want to change. Look at what needs they're meeting. Mm and consider a better way to meet it. Mm -hmm. Like I said, with the certainty, I mean, you get a lot of certainty out of an addiction because you know it's gonna make you feel better each time. You probably know where you can get it. You know that you're gonna do it at a certain time each day or consistently, you know it's definitely going to relieve pain or just give you a high. Or what else could you do to create safety in your life? Where else could you bring in something that's healthier and more sustainable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good questions to ask ourselves, I think. like. From this, I think a lot of people are going to be realizing that they need, they need a coach. Mm -hmm. They need someone to be able to help them untap that because yeah. it's just taking away the blinders of yeah. how much like how much there is to life and mm -hmm. also how limited we are in our life and the way that we think mm -hmm. and how binary we approach yeah. life. Yeah. And I think that it's a massive kind of um, wake up call. I want to say oh, to a lot of people because I think that even for me personally. Before I got into the entrepreneurial space and I was into this type of stuff, I never really knew anything about NLP or programming or coaching in general. I was very, I'm very, I was very anti-woohoo. You know what I mean? And I remember when we had yeah. our first child, I was like, trust me, I'm I'm very logical. Okay, like yeah, yeah. things have got to make sense. If it yeah, doesn't yeah. make sense, then me and you are not having a conversation. I think you're talking shit. Uh -huh. That's yeah. honest. That's the honest truth. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not until you kind of like you realize that that was just I was like a horse on, on a racetrack with the blinders mm -hmm. on and thinking that yeah. if one plus one doesn't equal two, yeah. then it's it. it's incorrect. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that really limits people because I remember when I um, first started changing my money story so that the mm. business could start making money without me stressing and panicking mm. about it. Mm. I remember um, having this sort of breakthrough moment. It was like, you know, those real those moments that are so impactful, you remember exactly where you were when it hit you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I mean, a little bit anticlimactic. I was just in the spare room hanging out washing. <laughs> 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 I was putting damp, like wet clothes on a clothes era in front of the heating yeah. vent. It was not very exciting. <laughs> but I was standing there and I suddenly had this realization about this whole issue with money. And because I grew up poor, I'd always had this really responsible and well-planned approach to money. Mm. I would never make any financial commitments that I wasn't sure I could like 100% service. Yeah. Mm. I would never go into any type of debt that I wasn't 100% sure I could make the payments on. Mm. I've never missed a rental mortgage payment in my life. Mm. Very um, rigid because, you know, I didn't want to be a burden to anybody. And mm. I had my stories about how, you know, you have to live within your means and you order off the menu based on the price, not based on what you feel like eating. Yeah. You know, you, and you, you can't just buy anything you want. You have to restrict it to your needs and all this sort of stuff. And I had this moment where I was standing there hanging out the washing and I was like, I don't actually have to change any of my beliefs on this the way that most people think you have to. I don't actually have to have this moment where I realize I'm wrong. 
these two concepts can exist at the same time, right? Mm. I can I can think that I'm right and still recognize that what I think is right isn't working. Mm. Right? Because if you could save, scrimp, and panic your way to a million dollars, I would have done it a hundred times over. Mm. I saved, scrimped, and panicked for decades. And the, the way that I grew up in my household, I mean, I'd been panicking about us not making the electricity bill since primary school. Yeah. Right? Like I, I knew there, there wasn't enough. There wasn't enough. There was never enough. I knew that from when I was yay big. Yeah. Right. And I remember standing there thinking, I still believe that you've got to be responsible and you've got to make smart choices and you've got to live within your means. And all of these beliefs, I can feel them in my system. I can feel that those neural pathways have a lot of myelin on them, right? Mm. They're cemented, they're secure. And I know this to be true. Mm. And it isn't working. Mm. Being really, really careful with money isn't producing any more money. Yeah. I'm I've been careful for decades and I'm still running out of money. Yeah. And I think a lot of people listening to this are gonna have that realization as well, where they're like, Yeah, I've been, you know, not spending beyond my means, not investing in myself until I feel safe and not doing any of those, yeah. you know, big leaps of faith that entrepreneurs have to do, you know, yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, and it hasn't worked. I'm not a millionaire. Yeah. Yeah. And I just had this moment where I was like, I can hold both of these ideas at the same time. Yeah. I've since learned that there's a term for that. It's binary taxonomy. It's it's conflicting mm. concepts at the same time. And it's, I can recognize that I can feel how much I believe things are the way they are. I can feel mm. my programming. I can feel that this is the way the world is. Mm. And simultaneously recognize that my outlook is not producing the result I want. And the people who have the result I want don't think the same way as me. Yeah. Mm. Right. And it, it, I, I remember saying to someone the other day, I was like, if that had been filmed, it would have been the most boring film in the world. Cause it's literally <laughs> doing just like straighten the t-shirt and then go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. And then go back to hanging out. Watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it was the most anticlimactic breakthrough in the world. Mm. And yet the fireworks that had just gone off inside my brain. And mm. ever since then I decided like in that moment, I was like, I will not panic about money. Yeah. I like ever again. And, you know, the very next day, the first email I got was a credit card bill and I could feel the pain coming up through my chest and I pushed the laptop away and I was like, no, this world, I'm not recreating this world. I'm not being this person anymore. Mm. I will not be pushed back into that costume. I will not be pushed back into that identity mm. for one more minute. Mm. No numbers on a screen tell me how I feel. Yeah. And I had like pushed the laptop away and like breathe it out. And it took, you know, a couple of weeks of basically self-correcting every day. But like people will go 20 years without changing their life significantly mm. or getting ahead financially. And it took two weeks of consistent effort before random money started showing up. And within 12 weeks, the business had stabilized at consistent five figure months that were not dependent on how many hours I worked. Mm. No marketing, no advertising, no changes in anything I did other than a total rewrite inside me mm. of what I believed about money. Yeah. And the business has been stable and fine ever since. Yeah. And that was years ago. That's amazing. That's incredible. So you can see why I'm passionate about getting this information to people. It doesn't matter how um, how reluctant they are to understand the impact of the mindset. I will continue to push this because I know from like not just my personal experience, but I've obviously worked with many people who've yeah. had these breakthroughs. Mm. It's it's the be all and end all. The, in, the inner work is the be all and end all. Hundred percent. And like limited people get that or even have the need to like even mm -hmm. like consider looking into that. And that's kind of the thing that even we're trying to do is that we're trying to push this message and yeah. allow people to take a lot more of a proactive approach to it and not so much of a reactive time when it's too late. So mm -hmm. I 100% resonate with that message. I think that's so important. I want to talk about one last topic before we kind of wrap up, and that's going to be the topic of love because what I've kind of gathered from a lot of the things you were saying is that a lot of it kind of ties down to love and deservability. And once you realize that you love yourself and you deserve these kind of things, somehow it just tends to happen. So how do you think people can develop that unconditional love for themselves? And no matter what, is happening because I know for us when we were doing business like I would I would attach all my worth and all my love uh -huh. to whether my business is performing or whether of I'm course. generating mm. that revenue or whether my, I know I've made my girlfriend smile or whatever yeah. it's like, yeah. and everyone kind of listening has something that makes them feel you know worthy or a, a noticeable mm. absence of things yes. that make them feel worthy 100% yeah. and that's what I'm still trying to work towards I'm, I'm a mm. bit better but I'm still you know working through it yeah. and I'm curious from yeah. your perspective like how do you think people will develop that unconditional love because I feel like once people can develop it then a lot of these other things like the other five parts that you were mentioning i think they start to slowly kind of um fold together mm. so if you've got two people and you're watching both of them on film yeah. maybe we put cameras in their house legally obviously yeah. <laughs> and you're watching both of them how do you know which one 
say it's two women, right? Yeah. How do you know which one loves themselves? How do you know visibly watching them go about their day in their house, what they're doing? Genuine question. How do you know which one loves themselves? It's a difficult question. I think that like off the top of my head, what my intuition is telling me is that people do things that, if that you love themselves, do people do things that make them happy mm -hmm. Yeah. compared to doing things that they feel like they should do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you nailed it. It's, it's task-based. The, the way to wire anything into the system is to adopt that identity and make the decisions of, and choices of that identity. Mm -hmm. The only difference between someone who doesn't love themselves and someone who does is that the person who does is making choices throughout the day that reflect it. Mm -hmm. So even if they don't feel yet in their system because the relevant neurons haven't cemented yet, if they, don't, if they can't feel it, if they continue to do the actions from the identity of someone who loves themselves, it will get cemented in the system. The system will start to know of itself and take on that identity of someone who loves themselves. So, you know, maybe you get the extra sleep you need. Maybe you choose water instead of beer. Maybe mm. you, like, it's different for everybody, right? You can't yeah. just tick off a bunch of things like went to yoga today, ate some celery, you know, like yeah. it's different for everybody. But, you know, for some of us, it's just getting out of sweatpants and stuff and getting into something that stops us feeling so like, ill <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right like sweats do that to me man they make mm. me feel like i'm getting around the house like i've just gotten over a horrific flu or something yeah. like, <laughs> try to stick to genes just because of the psychological impact of them yeah. right um but yeah that's the key difference is that you're gonna have to decide that if you want to be someone who loves themselves you will have to be them before you feel it and mm. it's the same issue with confidence people say oh i'll do that thing that i want always wanted to do in my life when i feel confident Confidence is just the product of your brain asking itself two questions. Have we done this before and did it go well? Yeah. Mm. Right? If you've never done it before, you can't generate confidence in the system. I mean, you may have done something similar and so your brain will be like, oh, well, you know, this is a long jump. We've always done, we've already done a high jump. This is, you know, mm. it's a variation. Mm. But if you're really branching out, like me going from risk management to running my own coaching business, mm. I don't have any reference files for that. Mm. So expecting to feel confident up front would have been ludicrous. Yeah. yeah. So knowing what I knew, because I've been studying um, personal development as a hobby for about 16 years by the time I, I oh, wow. started, um, I basically, it was desensitization therapy. I just opened my calendar up to anyone, literally <laughs> anyone. I just put up a sales page and I was like, I will talk to anyone for free, fill my calendar and I will <laughs> help you as much as I can. And I literally just packed my calendar. And I'll tell you, when you first, you know, the first call you get on with a stranger, from a different country, you've never met them, you don't know anything about their life, you get on that call, you are bricking it, 100%. Yeah. But by the 10th one, yeah, exactly, the bottom exactly line right. is you know that you're gonna listen, you know that you're gonna map what's going on for them, you know you're gonna hold space for what they're going through, and you know that you are gonna do your damnedest to give them something that will help them in some way, to guide them in a direction that will benefit them. And once you realize that, then you just, you just keep going. But it's the same with whatever your dream is, right? You wanna start mm -hmm. a business, waiting until you feel ready waiting until you feel confident, waiting mm. until you feel like you love yourself mm. before you give yourself what someone who loved themselves would give themselves. Mm. That was the, grammatically the worst sentence of my life. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know what I mean? Like if you, if you wanna love yourself, be the person who loves yourself. Yeah. Be the person who loves himself. Make the choices of that person so that you can wire that identity into your body. But if you're saying, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to take care of my health until I feel like I love myself. Yeah. You're standing in front of a fireplace, holding a bunch of logs saying, I will give you one of these logs as soon as you put out some heat. Yeah. yeah. And it's a big old no. You'll, mm. you'll choose to be that person when it becomes more important to you to be that person than to fuck around with your old identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Wow. That's such a great way. Perfect way to end. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was fantastic. Like there's so much in this, like, even me personally, I'm sitting there, I'm like, first time I'm so quiet. I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm thinking like, yo, there's so much that I can personally mm -hmm. extract from this. And like you said, like we've been doing this stuff for a long time, or well, a few years now. Mm -hmm. So we have a baseline yeah. level of understanding, but like the way that you explain it and articulate it is very, very eloquent and very simple to understand, I think. Nice. Um, so I think people are gonna get a lot of a lot of a lot of benefit out of this. I'm I really hope happy. so. I mean that's you know, that's why I come and do this stuff is yeah. because, you know, if, if more people can understand how it's not easy, but it can be simple. Yeah, right. And there's just exactly. so many people out there. It breaks my heart to think of how many people think that they're either too fucked up or too broken or, or the things that they dream of are impossible. If I could just get them to have a glimpse, even for five seconds of how not only possible, but in some area already done mm. that it is mm. right. I, yeah, 
that's the dream. Just get them to understand that it's totally possible and more importantly, it's totally possible for them. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the big part. That's yeah. it. Awesome. So Thank what we kind of do normally is like obviously we've spoken a lot, mm-hmm. but what we want to do a bit more is get to know you a little bit better. Okay. So we're going to um, conclude this on a rapid fire. Rapid five, actually, I should say. Jesus, so that gonna, sounds dangerous. It, it is. It's very dangerous. I hope it's not word association. That's going to go downhill real bad. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's, we should do that. Yeah, we should. So that's a good idea. I like yeah. that. <laughs> For the next one. But what we're going to do is we're going to ask you five simple questions. Short, sweet answers. One word. That's it. Okay. Um, ah, let's do it. We'll, yeah, we'll kick it off. I can't Just so that. the listeners know, by the way, I wasn't warned about this before I agreed to do this <laughs> podcast. Uh, yeah. She's lying. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes. <laughs> What's your favorite movie? Uh, the Matrix. I love The Matrix. The Matrix is hectic. And yeah. Patrick, our boy Patrick was in The Matrix. Really? Yeah, he was an extra in The Matrix when they came and filmed it. Yeah, yeah, they filmed yeah, it in Sydney, in right? Sydney. Yeah, yeah, a long, yeah. long time ago. I will say, though, the, um, it, the top three, because this is important, the Matrix, Fight Club, and Boondock Saints. That's all you oh. need to know about me. Terribly inappropriate sense of humor. Totally believe that all of this is not real, and <laughs> <laughs> and that karma is hilarious. Yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Those three. Karma is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, what's your favorite travel destination? Oh, uh, Malta. I went to Malta oh, wow. for a wedding, and it was unfreaking real. If you get the opportunity to go, it's amazing it's kind of like um greece but cheaper and the buildings are yellow instead of white um <laughs> and the people have like they're just amazing and the food is amazing and yeah it was one of the best holidays of my life oh, amazing and what's your favorite um what's the most important thing to you so not people not pets not phone laptop just a sentimental thing like an idea or an actual physical item We'll go, we'll go item first, but then I want to also want to hear your idea. Okay. What? Oh, God. What do I have that's super valuable? Gotcha. Yeah. This, <laughs> this is really... I'm trying to think of, like, if the building was on fire, what would I grab before yeah. I ran out? Um, better okay. Yeah, better way to Okay. Well, I'm going to go real sentimental then. And this surprises even me that this is what's come up. But I have a small hippopotamus that I was given. Mm. And I don't know who gave it to me. Someone... When I was very little, someone showed up at the house and just handed it to me and then left. So I have a hippopotamus, a small hippopotamus that uh, has stayed with me my whole life. And I would take the hippo and um, my two things from childhood, I have very few, almost nothing from my life prior to adulthood. I have almost Mm. nothing, but I have a small hippopotamus and I have my first t-shirt as a baby. And it's tiny. It's only about, because I was pretty small. It's uh, it's only about eight inches square. It's the tiniest little t-shirt. But it says, I'm the boss and I don't take no shit from anyone. Uh. <laughs> and it cracks me up. It still has food stains on it. But I would I, <laughs> like I would, I would save those in a fire. Yeah. 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 I would too, actually. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really great. Yeah. And what is the most attractive quality in somebody to you? Um, it's a toss up between a good sense of humor. Um, cause I grew up in a family that really values jokes, puns, one liners mm. and inappropriate conversation, mm-hmm. um, and curiosity. Mm. You got to stay curious. You have to be able to recognize that there's more to it. Yeah. You have, yeah. even if, even if you're like, even if there's fear preventing you from getting to that next stage just yet, mm. remaining curious takes, you know, yeah. more strength and more intelligence than I think people realize. Yes. Yes. And what's your number one tip slash advice for life? Jesus, that's so freaking broad. Uh, Number one advice for life. Uh, Okay, recognize that the whole thing is a game. You're Mm. not broken. Um, It's literally just data and feedback and you are working your way through one iteration of Earth School. You are here to evolve your soul and you will get the relevant trials and tribulations that will help you get those lessons. So just, you know, take care of your body, try to stay in the game and recognize that Nobody gets out alive, so stop taking it so seriously. <laughs> I love that. Yes. <laughs> that was sick. Um, this episode was just so amazing. I had a lot of fun, Sarah. I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. And I was kind of like, I was very engrossed in the conversation. Yeah. And that's a massive kind of indicaciones for me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Whether, um, you know what I mean? And, 100%. And it's really interesting. And it's like, no, nah, I really took a lot out of that. So I'm really, really happy. I'm yeah. Really happy. The same ways and i think that our audience will be just as appreciative as we are as well so i really want to just honor you thank you so much for coming and just showing up and just giving us everything for people that obviously <laughs> listen they love that and they want to connect with you where do you think are the best places for people to, to connect and find you 
Uh, I'm most active on Instagram. Um, so Sarah Riley Coaching, Sarah with an H, R-E-I-L-L-Y. And uh, sarahreillycoaching.com is about to get an overhaul, but it's still active and live. So if you want to submit any questions or have a look at any of my content, there's a lot of freebies on there as well as paid courses. Um, yeah, and I'm sometimes on Facebook under Sarah Riley Coaching as well, but I think, you know, way more active on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And you guys obviously know where to find us at... Um Instagram. Literally, obviously, you know exactly where to <laughs> find us on. And because they already know, because they already know, let Nick know. They already know. know. <laughs> that's why I didn't even say it. That's how I usually conclude. No, you know where to find us. That's it. Everywhere at Nick and Femi. Instagram, you know, Instagram, YouTube. Facebook, YouTube. Probably Pinterest. I don't know. Do we have a Pinterest? Pinterest no, know. we don't have a Got Pinterest. Why well, would we have a Pinterest? Twitter though. Do we have Twitter? No. I'm making one. And oh, well, Twitter and TikTok. Well, everywhere we have Nick and Femi. And yeah, that's it. That's a wrap. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, you so much. See you guys in the next Sarah. episode. Awesome. Thanks, guys.